All right. Well, thanks for having me in, everybody. I uh, decided to change it up a little bit about what I was talking on. Um, for the most part, our, our, our produce portfolio is, is relatively the same as last year. Um, and usually I get to you guys on that kind of stuff through different label updates. And so instead, I decided to talk a little bit about these plant activators. And I'm actually giving a presentation from Jeanette Rapcavalli. Um, a lot of you may have already known her. She was with Syngenta on the R&D side for, for a long time, and now she has recently moved over to the agronomist role. So if you didn't know her, you guys will be seeing a lot more of her, and that's a, a really good thing for the area. She's, she's worked uh, in, in desert agriculture and done a lot of, uh, a lot of trial work for us and, and is responsible for a lot of the tools that we have getting to us. And so um, we're really lucky to have her. And so if I butcher any of this, Jeanette, feel free to jump in and tell me where I'm, where I'm being silly. <laughs> so, um, so plant defense activators, I, I think you guys use a different term for them in academia. Is it primers? Uh, um, priming agents, things like that basically uh, uh, the point of them being to, to uh, induce, induce reactions in the plant in order to, to boost their immunity. Um, and so this is a, this is a, a kind of a complicated model uh, for a very simple idea. And basically plants that detect pathogens will activate a defense. Um, the pathogens on step two will overcome the defense. Then the plant will uh, deploy a stronger defense and build resistance, and then the pathogens will evolve and overcome that resistance and be susceptible again. And that's the continual pattern that we're always fighting out here between getting resistant uh, populations of whether it's insects or disease or whatever it is the plant is fighting with. So with, with plant defense activators, we're essentially trying to target this first defense step here and, and activating their defense system early on and trying to do it before the threat has actually shown up. The way this works is the, the, the plants, the different threats have evolved and developed different um, um, molecular patterns that the plants are capable of recognizing. Uh, and these are pathogen associated molecular patterns. So each one of these, whether it's a bacteria or a, a fungus or, or, or a virus, the plant is able to, to determine what those are with pattern uh, 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 recognition uh, receptors that are on the plant. And after they've picked them up with the receptors, they will have a pattern triggered immunity. And that can be a really broad spectrum response. There's not, even though they can detect different threats, it doesn't mean that the threat will, will, will induce a specific response for that threat. It'll be really broad spectrum. This is a little, a little, little uh, uh, animation that, that, that Jeanette had come up with, but that's essentially what we were just talking about. Um, the receptor picks up the threat, it signals, and, uh, and we get a PTI response. And so with plant response activators, we're essentially trying to uh, uh, skip over some of that and just get straight to PTI and get to the pattern triggered immunity. And there's a lot of different ways, like I said, it can be really broad spectrum. When this happens, they can, uh, a plant can release uh, reactive oxygen species, so uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide essentially uh, being on the surface, and that can ward off a lot of different things for the plant. Um, structural barriers, actually uh, 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 Dr. Slinsky was just talking about some of these with fusarium, but um, tyloses are what these are called, and, and Jeanette actually took this picture herself. It's uh, barriers that they'll create inside the xylem to, to prevent the disease from spreading, and that's basically what we're trying to control with these is, is, well, you're not essentially controlling it, you're just stopping the spread from getting any worse, and so, um, so that's, that's, that's just, these are just a spectrum of what they can do, um, or defense related hormones such as salicylic acid. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get back to salicylic acid. Once this happens, you're, you're essentially, you're, you're priming the plant to, to respond to a threat before the threat actually exists. It's like boosting your immune system, um, in, in mammals. And so what we want to do with them is expose the plant to a small amount of the agent that induces these and get it ready uh, ahead of time before it is, is faced with a threat, and, uh, and then hopefully tolerate the, the, the infection better once that happens. And there's a lot of different products that have, that have been studied for this, but there's very few that have actually made it to market. Um, and and, and well, ActiGuard being one of, those, one of those products, I can't even, I can't even think of any others that have actually, that actually fall into this frack group that have made it to market, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, there are some limitations to that. <clears throat> the degree of efficacy depends on the crop and the response depends on the crop and it depends on, on the threat as well. And so, like I said, it's, it's a broad spectrum um, response that the plant has. And so there's been, there's been a, a, a long time running of trying to narrow down for each crop what that response is and, uh, and uh, what, it, what, it, what its efficacy is against that threat. 
And so the timing is very important. You obviously, just like all of our, all of our, um, um, all of our chemical tools we have, you need to be ahead of it so that you're not, um, not falling behind. It's the same for this. The plant needs time to actually build up its, its immune defenses once you spray it, so you don't want it getting on when the threat's already there. Um, repeated applications are needed throughout the, the season, meaning if you just spray this up front, that doesn't mean that its immune system is going to be prepared for threats for the rest of the season. Um, you might need more, and, and you, can, you might have to even tailor that a little bit depending on what you're dealing with, um, depending on what crop you're growing. Uh, there can be a fitness cost, meaning that you don't, you, it needs to be a healthy plant that you're spraying it to. If you're already dealing with abiotic pressures or, or heavy, heavy insect damage or things, if the plant's already in a, in a poor state, it's not going to necessarily have the ability to, to, to respond to the inducing agent and, uh, and get the reaction that we're chasing. Um, the big benefits to these, and one, one that's, that's, uh, that's probably the most useful to us is that it's a unique frat group, <clears throat> and it does not, there, there's a reduced amount, a reduced chance of resistance because you're not directly targeting the pathogen itself. And so rather than, rather than uh, a, a chemical spray that, that uh, you know, maybe uses a specific cellular pathway or, 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 or gets onto a certain binding site, the, the plant is releasing a, a whole series of defenses against it. And so you're not, you're not attacking just one aspect of the, of the uh, anatomy of that, of that disease. And so it, 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 it's, it's makes your, it makes your uh, resistance management a little more robust. Um, so, and that makes the, the chance of resistance, uh, uh, the chance of resistance a little less because you're not directly attacking the pathogen. Um, it is broad spectrum as far as, as being able to have efficacy against bacteria, fungus, and, and, uh, and even viruses, um, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, a little further here. And they're very safe to handle, which is nice. And, and this, this, I know it's, <laughs> a lot of this sounds very snake oily, <laughs> and you know, as, as there's, I think there's a lot of products that claim to do things, but, but uh, uh, ActiGuard is one that's been around for a while. People have seen, seen its, its efficacy for themselves. And uh, the reason that I wanted to talk about it again, despite it being around for a while, was to, uh, I guess, re reframe what it is and what it's doing. Because I think it, it, it sometimes gets wrapped up, into, uh, wrapped up into the list of downy products. And it, it, it does, you know, it has great efficacy on downy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a downy mildew product. And so, um, and I think if you treat it that way, you're, you're, you, need, you need to manage your expectations of what you're trying to accomplish with it. If you treat it that way, you're going to be disappointed. If you treat it as it is and use it as it's supposed to be used, I think you'll, be, you'll really be happy to use it. Um, so it's a FRAC uh, P01. That's, that's the plant defense activator FRAC group. Um, um, water dispersible granule, which is nice because a lot of other products that do these, uh, that might have plant defense activity are biologicals. And uh, obviously storing biologicals out here in the desert can get pretty tricky as far as uh, um, um, expiration goes. And so you don't have to worry about that with a dry granule. Grams and supplement with this don't replace with this. Um, it's got a really broad spectrum of activity because of the, because of the broad spectrum response that it causes. And uh, those two highlighted in ray, or excuse me, in red are uh, that Brimia lactuae and uh, uh, was that Pernasphora esfusa? Those are, those are big bounty mildew causers here in the desert, and that's why they're highlighted in red. Um, like, like I mentioned earlier, they, it gets wrapped up into the, the downy mildew product list um, because it's what it has the highest uh, efficacy on in lettuce, and it's what it's labeled for. And so I pulled this. This, this slide uh, was, a, was a, a mildew trial, downy mildew trial, done by the U of A here. Um, um, by Dr. Podell, and, and it, originally it was, it was put onto a, an Arondis Ultra slide. That's why the, the red arrow is there next to it, because it, it performed very well in it. And if you look at this, it's, it's obvious, you know, you, you compare all these products together and you put ActiGuard into that, and ActiGuard doesn't look like it's performing very well. But I think the, the, only, the only comparison that I would make in this, this trial is ActiGuard to the untreated check, uh, mainly because that was ActiGuard sprayed by itself, and that is disease severity that they're measuring in that trial. And that, that severity was essentially cut in half by using ActiGuard. It just, just by utilizing the plant's own ability to defend itself against infection. And that's, I mean, that's, that's nuts to me. If, if you told me any crop, if you told me you could cut uh, 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 a disease, you know, increase its resistance by double. If you had a, if you had a, a spinach variety 
that was capable of, of being twice as resistant to downy mildew, I think most people would jump all over that. And so I think it's a, a worthy investment to, to, to include on your, on your management programs. So that's, that's what we have it labeled on now. That's where I see the, probably the most use of it get. And, uh, and, uh, but there are some new possibilities that we have uh, coming forward, and there's been some new research that's been done. We've talked about mainly fungicide and, and, and bacterial control with, with it. Um, but what about insect vectored viruses? Viruses are, are much more difficult to handle. Um, you know, there is, I, I don't like calling fungicides any fungicide curative, even though there are some curative properties to them. Well, there is nothing curative for viruses, similar to the human body. Once you get them, essentially, they just have to run their course. So your only, your only chance of dealing with them is, is, uh, is uh, preventative, um, which we're all used to. It's, it's you know, that's most, most of the PCA, um, uh, most of your job is preventative. And so, but 70% but of these viruses are vectored by insects. And so knowing that that's basically your only chance of stopping a viral infection is to control the insects that vector it. Well, you guys have seen white fly and melons. You've seen you know, the, the, the millions of white fly that you can have uh, 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 on a couple of plants. And so the chance of killing all of them that might vector that, that pathogen is very low. So is there a way to maybe reduce that infection? Um, there was a trial done uh, uh, by Dr. Mock in UC Riverside. <clears throat> and these uses are not registered, just keep in mind, but hopefully maybe at some point we'll have enough evidence to, to register them. Um, but they did do some trials against CYSDV and melons. And, uh, and uh, essentially what they did is they inoculated um, with CYSDV and treated at one true leaf stage on some melons. They allowed a white fly to feed for 48 hours, um, pulled them out. Three weeks later, they evaluated them in planta, so meaning while the plant was still actively growing. And uh, ActiGuard treatments significantly reduced the COISDV concentration and the symptoms of the melon. Um, and so they're, they're very excited about it. We're very excited about it. Um, we're going to continue pursuing it. Um, but one other thing we'd like to, to, to try to stop outside of just the stopping the viral load is maybe stopping the feeding that the, the vectors want to do on the plant. And so uh, uh, in similar fashion, they also treated with ActiGuard and COISDV inoculation. They uh, uh, monitored them for 24 hours. And across all time points in that 24 hours, the uh, ActiGuard treated plants were, were less preferred by a significant amount by the white fly. And so like I said, this is not registered for that, but ActiGuard is registered melons for a lot of other diseases that you deal with, especially like powdery mildew. And so uh, if you were to ever use it, you know, let me know if you're putting it on melons. I'd like to see, you know, at least keep, keep your eye out for your own, your own observations to see if that's, if, that's, uh, if that's happening for you or not. But we are pursuing that further. And uh, this, this slide here, this, uh, there, there was no effect on melon yield uh, uh, negatively. You know, you, can, you might think, well, if I'm using resources early to increase the immune system, am I taking from resources from yield later? And there has not been any evidence for that. And lastly, we are going to be uh, uh, looking at this on, um, on INSV as well. There are some, some trials that are getting set up for that to see if we get the same kind of results that we did from the CYSDB. But in short, they, uh, they prime the plant, these, these, the things like ActiGuard, to be, to be uh, prepared for an infection ahead of time. Um, they're not curative. They do not act directly against the pathogen, so they, that helps with resistant management. Supplement your, your practices with it. Do not replace your practices with it. And uh, more is not always better. It's just because it does well at one ounce doesn't mean you can fire out six ounces and expect the same results, or if not, negative results. So. Um, but like I said, we are, we are looking at some other opportunities with it. If you guys think of something you'd like to see it on, um, um, please let me know. And, uh, and also, I missed the INSV meeting. This just I want to touch on this really quick before I'm done on something separate. We do have a, a newer um, thrip material coming out, new insecticide, I should say. Not, it's not just for thrips. Um, I don't have a ton of information to give you guys that on. I know Dr. Palumbo's got some, some great results with it, and you'll be seeing more of that. He's honestly going to know more about it than I am um, because they, they like to keep that information away from us salesmen so we don't go off and do what we do and sell it too early. Um, but it, we're really excited about it. There's a lot of results you're going to see on it. And so going forward, I, I don't have a whole lot of information to give you guys on that product. Um, um, but as, as, I'm, as I'm able to and I'm given more info, I'll pass it along to you. But, but uh, thank you guys for having me out here. And uh, I've, I've got to take off to another meeting. But if you're a PCA, you have my phone number. If you're a grower, you have your PCA. So if you have any questions on it, yeah, they'll get to me. Thank you.
My name is Macy Keith. I live in Yuma. Um, I have a little bit of PCA background um, in leafy greens, um, primarily organics when I was walking in the field. So a um, uh, background of mine as well is industry member selling fertilizer. So I've been able to take all of these steps in my career and apply them. And this summer, I've really kind of developed this presentation on organic IPM in leafy greens um, because I think we're all so used to being in the cycle of conventional, um, but the real the reality is organics is about 30 to 35 percent of our leafy green market, and that is a huge chunk when we're looking at the dollars and the acres that are um, applied. Robert, how do I uh, have an issue? Skip into my next slide. So um, while we're getting this, oh, thank you, squared away. Uh, we. My company, San Agro, has been around since the 80s, formerly known as Westbridge. Um, in California, Central Valley area, we kind of are known as the organic specialists in the tree market um, because we have a full line of liquid nutrients and crop protection products, and just really overall a lot of different crop inputs. Um, so what we're all familiar with, um, back to the traditional conventional um, production, is the IPM triangle. Where as you move up from prevention to intervention, your toxicity increases with each decision step that you make. So I don't, for the sake of time, I don't really need to go down and explain what we're going through. But you know, the first step is cultural, physical, biological, and chemical. And I'm just trying to shift the ideas um, and apply these into an organic IPM situation. Um, and so to do that, you really have to evaluate what. Um, IPM is and what it is not. These are a few dif different definitions um, from federal agencies such as the EPA and the USDA. And then my favorite definition, which is the California DPR. It's a little bit long-winded, but we all know California in general likes to make everything long-winded. But within this definition, I think that it encompasses what you're doing in integrated pest management. And that is using all the different strategies. But eventually, when you come to a point in decision making, you're going to need to take a step where you're going to use some sort of chemistry. And generally, it's going to be synthetic. And therefore, it's not going to be organic. So um, although it's an ecosystem-based strategy, eventually, you're going to rely on a tool that's not going to be very uh, sustainable, so to speak, or organic. Um, and so since the last resort is used on synthetic pesticides, um, by definition, IPM is not organic. Um, IPM selects pesticides that are effective and economical and least disruptive to the production system. So that may be whatever product the decision maker uses is within, within their uh, definition of IPM. Uh, what we do to mitigate some of these obstacles caused by lack of tools in organic chemistries um, are using more cultural, mechanical, and physical tactics. Uh, that is going to come down to specific timing and really understanding the biology, bio, biology of these pests that we're trying to control. Um, and then also encourage, encourage biologicals. So encourage the natural enemy populations, and that's going to be using more selective pesticides, timely and appropriately, so that they can work to the best of their capacity. We're pretty limited on the tools that we have in the organic market, so making sure that they're applied correctly is critical. So two products I'm going to touch on today um, are BioLink insect and bird repellent. It's part of our BioLink line. Uh, it's got our BioLink line is compromised of 17 different crop inputs. Um, and this one is our insect and bird repellent. And then our, gar um, our gargoyle product, which is our biopesticide. It controls soft-bodied insects and diseases. But today, we're going to talk, talk on the insect component. Um, and so this is a few of the products that I've applied in an organic IPM model. You could really use any one of our many products and apply it different ways within the structure. Um, but essentially, the idea is that moving from prevention to intervention in an organic IPM model doesn't have to mean increased toxicity risks. The BioLink product, uh, the insect and bird repellent, it is a 20% garlic extract. So again, the idea is that it's repelling, it's not killing. Um, and we're using it timely and appropriately. We're not using it as a cure-all whenever we already have a field infested with birds. This is something that we're going to start at establishment. 
Um, the label information is pretty basic. We can go from 16 ounces to a gallon per acre depending on the application rate or the application scenario. Um, you don't want to spray to the point of runoff because the idea is that this material sits on the plants and you want it to um, repel, so runoff and into the soil um, can have its benefits, but it's also you know just ideal to keep it on the plant. Um, mixing instructions, this product performs better at a 5.5 to 6 pH. I think that's critical in organic chemistries um, to read the label and know if it needs to be buffered to buffer it. Um, the, again, the timing and the pest pressure, we want to start at establishment, so at planting, at 0% pressure because this is a repellent, um, not a pesticide. So um, we've got a few different scenarios in, the, in Yuma that we're putting this out, and I'll touch on those later. Temperature, uh, 70 to 90 degrees is what we like it to be applied at because the garlic can, um, it, it doesn't have a really long life cycle in the sun, so with you know the early morning, late night applications, and of course the adjuvants, anything that you want to stay on top of the uh, plant surface is going to work better with the proper adjuvant. Um, this is a trial we did last some last this time last year that actually was a great um, preliminary trial for me. I had just started with the company, and I really wanted to see the capacity that this product could work at. So we just went at planting after germ water, chemigated this insect and bird repellent to really get the lettuce seed past the seedling stage so that it's no longer vulnerable to the birds and the beetles and all the other trash bugs in the field. Um, it wasn't a very large trial, but a couple acres and we did see a difference. And so from there we were able to investigate and even dial down those timings more and we've got a lot more acres covered with this this year just based off of that timing structure. Um, it's versatile, safe on beneficials. It also, the garlic extract enhances the uptake of other fertilizers and chemicals you're using it with. We started using this with uh, spinosad for the uptake in onion thrip. I have a quick graph to show on that, but we learned that it has many other properties. Um, so essentially what it's doing is, for the birds at least, it's um, aiding in behavioral manipulation. Really, it's just if you take the idea of you cutting onions, you just don't like it, you don't want to do it, and the birds kind of have the same idea. They just want to stay away. And it does wear off, and so you do another application until you're past that point of vulnerability. This is the trial I was discussing on the insect and bird repellent with the spinosad. You can tell the um, yellow bar is the combination of the two, and over each treatment, this was a heavily infested, so they did weekly treatments because it was close to harvest. So um, it kept it effective, and even uh, compared to the spinosad alone, as it was kind of building resistance within the plant, which is the spinosad, the insect and bird repellent was able to make it more effective. So this product really also aids in um, efficacy for other pesticides it's being used with. Our gargoyle product, um, it is our insect and bird repellent plus cinnamon oil. So the cinnamon oil does kill the insects on contact. The garlic excites them and gets them moving around and also helps with the penetration. It's a 25B product, Omri um, and all Arizona, California, and all other states that it's required. Um, it's got a zero REI, or at least until the plants are dry. Um, it's this insect component of the label, soft-bodied um, mealybugs, mites, and then of course the disease component, which I'll just explain is a powdery mildew and a botrytis label. So as we um, move, up the la uh, move up the IPM triangle and we're deciding to pull the trigger on gargoyle, we know that it's still going to be effective and least toxic in an organic IPM model. Um, I'll kind of skim through this essentially. I uh, had another trial with success in the gargoyle, kind of an off-label on my I, crazy idea and the biology of the vine mealybug in Coachella Valley. Um, it doesn't technically overwinter. It still lives in the soil and populates at a much slower rate, but it's still in there. And then once the heat comes on, they move up the vine, and that's when they start becoming a really um, economic um, pest, and that's when they start have to applying for that. But in organic, they don't really have any tools. Conventionally, they can put an imidacloprid out there, and it have no issues. But organic is something they struggle with. So we did a gargoyle soil applied, um, soil applied through the drip early spring to kind of suppress the populations in the soil before the summer temperatures came on. And what we did was to observe it. We took X amount of vines 
and just observed all the vine mealybug at every life stage. So um, the takeaway is we can see the webbing indicates more eggs and the less presence of the mealybugs overall um, kind of draws a conclusion for me that we significantly suppress a life cycle in that vine mealybug um, population and that was able to make, you know, the, the, at the point the crop stage is uh, the stretching of the bunches and so when that um, honeydew secretion gets in those bunches, it creates sooty mold. So we're able just to kind of prolong that vulnerable point of the crop cycle. One last graph I'll throw out you, throw out you and I'll be done with the data, but this is something we did last year in Yuma to compare gargoyle with a spinosad, not to uh, replace it, but to be um, a rotational product and to see how it compared effectively. So we were measuring the damage on broccoli. Um, and what we can see, really the big take home, we did uh, seven different treatments with gargoyle and spinosad and different surfactants, but across the board, we could see that gargoyle and, spin and the spinosad were controlling at the same rate. And I think that's really important to understand because we know we can use gargoyle on the front end when we have lesser pressures to really keep those populations down so that when we need to use that spinosad, because traditionally we know within the plant, will build a resistance to the spinosad in the crop cycle. We want to save those ounces so that they can be effective and actually work whenever we need them to, whenever we have high, high temperatures, et cetera. So this was very valuable. We're taking it and applying it again this season. Buffering, a good adjuvant, of course, with the gargoyle, same, same thing. Um, we have a citric acid, the part of our biolink line. It's a 50% uh, citric acid, so you only need a couple ounces to achieve your optimum pH. Our gargoyle is a percent dilution, so it's a percent of your overall water volume. It's 1% rate is typically what I recommend. So if you got 100 gallons, you're going to want a, one gallon of gargoyle. I think in organics, we need to really evaluate with these types of products that we need to have them at a percent solution and not ounces or gallons per acre because the more water volume, the greater coverage you're going to get. And I think that's critical. Um, and that's the biggest takeaway. So the more water, the better. And then one last thing I want to touch on, suppress our uh, herbicide. It's been around for a few years now and we have great results. When it's applied correctly, it works every time. There's a lot of different variables and um, a lot of investigating on situations where they don't work, um, but generally there was a misstep. So we really um, like to stress the importance of the process of mixing and agitating when you're using Suppress. This graph is just to show you the three different label rates that we have for Suppress. It's 3%, 6%, and 9%. This is just showing that once you get up to that 6 and 9%, you're really not seeing that much um, more control, and this is an organic herbicide, and nothing about that really sounds uh, cost-effective. So when you're looking at that, it really might be more economical to say it that 6%. We've broken it down to a suppressed recipe. We print these off and give it to applicators so you know exactly what you're doing, the right temperature, nozzles, adjuvants, and then the steps for mixing and spraying. And then this is my last slide, but I wanted to show how adjuvants matter. I covered the names because I'm not trying to knock any adjuvants. Every single one is important in the proper use. But um, you can just tell this uh, suppress needs to be agitated constantly when it's being applied. And this picture was, these pictures were taken five minutes after agitation. So uh, tr typically the fatty acids will settle regardless. But um, on, the pic on the cylinder to the left, uh, you can really see the fatty acids on top separated. Actually, they were sticking to the sides of the tank. So that is like worst case scenario in a herbicide application. And it shows in the field, um, it, without a doubt, it shows what the situation was. So again, here's the um, percent solutions of our product for suppress on the label. Uh, the cylinder in the middle is obviously the best um, homogenous blend of our fatty acids in solution. So the correct adjuvant always matters. Thank you, guys. Um, Feel free to reach out with any questions.
My name is Mark Siemens, and I'd like to get started out recognizing the collaborators and people that also worked on this project. Uh, Victor Gunnez Jr., he's a technician, works for me. Uh, Nicholas Barr, he was a grad student working on this project. And also Steve Fenimore with uh, UC Davis, he's a co-PI. So um, basically the background behind this, the premise of this work is it's, it's uh, quite well known that raising soil temperatures to about 140 degrees and maintaining that temperature for 20 minutes is an effective method for controlling uh, weeds and soil-borne pathogens. A lot of you are probably pretty familiar with soil so solarization. Basically, you're doing the same thing, heating the soil surface to a fairly high temperature, controlling weed seeds and soil-borne pathogens. There's a, a graph here on the, the right, kind of shows a, a distribution, a um, lot of literature out there, so it's, it's a little bit nebulous. But if you look at that, that chart, you can see um, weeds are uh, uh, fairly, some are, they're harder to control than say, for example, something like nematodes. Of course, there's different size weeds. Uh, nutsedge, for example, would be a lot harder to control than a, a small seeded crop such as uh, purslane. So you can see that distribution there. Um, <clears throat> so the, the technique of using steam to heat soil for uh, uh, pest control uh, has been around a long time, actually over a hundred years, uh, fairly common technique, and it's still used today. It's used in greenhouses and nurseries uh, to uh, essentially uh, pasteurize the soil. There's also been some work in moving this um, technology to uh, uh, fuel production. A lot of these machines are, are coming out of Europe. Limitation of these machines <clears throat> is that they treat the entire so soil profile. And as you might imagine, this is uh, uh, fairly slow and energy intensive. So what we're doing in this project is exploring the concept of band steam. And in band steam, what we're doing is we're heating the soil in narrow strips before planting, disinfesting that soil. And after the soil cools, come back in, plant the crop into those disinfested bands, uh, hopefully control all the weeds, the soil-borne pathogens, and um, um, I, <laughs> I guess... Um, I don't know what the, where I was going with that, but the weeds outside the seed line, as you know, can be um, uh, easily cultivated out. Okay, so goals of this project were one, to develop a, a band steam applicator and then determine if it was uh, uh, able to raise soil temperatures to 140 degrees for 20 minutes and then evaluate its efficacy for controlling weeds and soil borne pathogens. The machine we uh, developed is principally comprised of a steam generator mounted on an elongated bed shaper and as you pull this machine through the field, it injects steam into the soil uh, while simultaneously shaping the bed. We tried a lot of different methods for injecting steam, um, some ahead of the, the bed shaper, and then also from the top of the bed shaper through some uh, ports that blow steam directly down on top of the soil surface. I have a video here showing the device operating. So again, uh, 
As we're moving through the field, we're injecting steam into narrow bands. And then uh, Nick Barr is in the back. What we're doing here is uh, recording soil temperature. And he'll come up in a... So he's putting in thermocouples uh, at different depths. We, we looked at um, soil temperature at one inch, two inch, three inch, and four inch, and across the four inch wide band. So um, the center probes are in the center of the um, seed line, and the other outer two are, are um, uh, two inches to one side or the other. You can see here the soil temperatures we're re reaching again here at this is the one inch depth, two inch depth, three and four. So you can see here we're getting those soil um, pretty hot. <laughs> um, part of the project was trying to figure out the best method for injecting steam. And what we found was uh, the, what we, uh, the best method for injecting steam was actually uh, in uh, from the bed shaper it's, itself. We use these uh, uh, steam injectors mounted on the flat of the bed shaper, put them about three inches apart. You can see here we are um, uh, had some holes in these injectors. We're injecting them to the left and right and also to the rear. And that worked, um, we found uh, pretty well. Here's some of the results. You can see here we met our, our target uh, temperatures and 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 dwell times and then <clears throat> this is a cross section of the bed and um <laughs> i guess i'm kind of proud of this slide uh we did a, a nice job of controlling and maintaining the heat just in our target band four inches wide by two or three inches deep so over the last uh, course of the last couple of years we conducted a series of trials both here in yuma and also in salinas california the, the main treatment effect was amount of applied steam. And we adjusted the amount of steam we applied by adjusting the travel rate. So we looked at high, high, um, high amounts of steam, made sure we reached our target temperature, or exceeded them, then also low rates of steam to see what the effect would be and if we could be more energy, um, uh, uh, use less energy. So we look, uh, crops we were looking at were iceberg and romaine lettuce and our evaluate, uh, assessments were soil temperature, weed and disease control. Here's some of the results of the, the trial. Here we're looking at two different travel rates, three quarters of a mile an hour and half a mile an hour. And you can see here at the lower speed where we're applying more steam, uh, we effectively reached our, our target temperature where we went a little bit faster. We were a little bit, we didn't quite reach our, our target temperature. And the uh, uh, initial soil temperature was around 120 degrees. Put in this slide, <clears throat> uh, trying to, uh, the point here is our travel speed was 0.2, almost um, <clears throat> half or definitely less than half or a third of the travel speed that I showed in the previous trial. Difference here is the initial soil temperature. This was done in the winter. Our initial soil temperature was a little bit under 50 degrees. You compare that to um, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, we were able to travel much faster. Makes sense, right? The higher the, the soil temperature, less energy you need to apply to that soil to raise it to the, the target temperature. We control. Um, we were, I was pretty surprised at this result. Um, almost 100% weed control uh, in three of our trials. And you can see here the, the nice clean uh, strips, uh, roughly four inches wide. Um, putting some numbers to that, um, here's the table. And again, <clears throat> our treatments here are what I'm calling an average rate which is basically the, the speed or steam application rate we uh, knew would meet our target temperatures. Going a little bit slower than that, uh, make sure we are uh, uh, basically uh, cook the soil and then uh, a higher speed, see if we can uh, conserve energy and what effect that might have on the uh, um, uh, 
performance of the machine. You can see here where we were at our average in high speed, very good weed control, over 80%. And um, what was very encouraging here is even where we uh, weren't meeting our target temperature, we still had very good weed control, about uh, 75%. These are results from another trial. Um, again, uh, excellent weed control, 85%. <clears throat> as far as sclerotinia, lettuce drop, um, in one of our trials, we didn't have a lot of pressure, didn't see any significant differences there. In another trial, we had um, uh, pretty good uh, disease incidents, and in the pots where we use steam, uh, pretty significant decrease, 70% in this case. What was pretty interesting in this trial and kind of throughout all the trials we conducted is there was uh, the plots that were treated with steam had noticeably better initial uh, or crop bigger uh, essentially initially and then throughout the growing season. Um, Hopefully you can see the uh, difference there. And this translated into a, a significant increase um, uh, in, in both of these trials. For its fusarium control, again here we're looking at our uh, uh, two speeds, in this case three quarters of a mile an hour <coughs> and half a mile an hour. And we got a, a, a very good reduction in the amount of fusarium in the soil assays that we, we collected. When you put that, so we were all excited, took, tried it in the field, and here's our results. Pretty, uh, pretty much wiped out everything, uh, no response. However, in this trial, saw a definite uh, response. Um, steam uh, looked a lot healthier, uh, a lot more plants. And the difference between these two fields was one had a very high initial inoculum load, the other one had a moderate load. Here's uh, some of the numbers. Again, our three different um, steam application rates and the number of infected plants. Um, again, pretty much across the board, a 50% reduction in the number of uh, diseased plants. Uh, regardless of how much steam we applied. As far as uh, marketable yield, uh, a very significant increase over roughly double or more, depending on the crop, iceberg or romaine. Um, and again, what's, what's very encouraging about this result is we can essentially travel three times, or uh, I don't know what, how that would convert 15 out of 25. Um, anyway, significantly faster and not meet these published, established um, guidelines for disease control and still see a significant increase. So of course, if you're reducing your, your fuel cost by let's say half or increasing your travel speed by half, that's gonna reduce your fuel, uh, fuel cost and get more acres done per hour. Okay, as far as, um, um, is it cost effective? What, um, so we, here's, here's some numbers uh, to that point. And the big point here is that, like, as I mentioned before, it really depends on your initial soil temperature. In the fall, when our soil temperatures are high, we were able to go three quarters of a mile an hour. Our fuel costs were very moderate, less than $200 an acre and our work rate was fairly reasonable for this type of operation, about a quarter acre per hour. Compare that to the winter, where our initial soil temperatures are low. Um, our, we had to reduce our travel speed to a, a, a fifth as compared to the summer. The fuel costs go up, approaching $1,000 an acre, and our um, work rate is uh, pretty, <laughs> um, uh, less than ideal, almost 28 hours per acre. So that's 
Um, uh, pretty significant. So how, um, so here's what uh, a concept we're working with this year. So the uh, steam generator we were using is 35 boiler horsepower. They make larger capacity steam generators. Um, so if you essentially double the uh, boiler capacity or uh, steam generation um, capacity, then you can essentially double the width of the machine. And another factor is if you reduce the depth of your treatment um, from three inches to inch and a half and get the, the, the weed seed that, uh, which the majority of them do, from the top inch, inch and a half of the soil, um, we can use half the energy. We're only treating half the depth of the soil. So if we are using half the energy, we can double our speed. You put all this together and we could go four times. Um, um, our work rate would increase by a factor of four. If you do this, um, I don't know if it will pan out in actual studies, but we could go a, a mile and a half an hour. Fuel costs less than $100 an acre. Uh, do an acre an hour, and this might be a, a viable solution for us here as a, a fall treatment. Even in the winter, the numbers get a lot uh, better, and um, rather then read them to you, I'll let you just kind of take a look at them. So in, in summary, <clears throat> um, we, our trial results were very encouraging. Uh, steam uh, is providing excellent weed control. We're getting d disease control. Um, depends on the species you're trying to control. Uh, it's better at controlling sclerotinia than some of the harder uh, control or harder pathogens like fusarium um, and uh, again I think the initial uh, uh, good fit is going into the fall when our initial uh, soil temperatures are high. As far as continuing this project um, we did get some funding for a second generation uh, prototype. It's a uh, <laughs> um, uh, higher capa capacity, it's a simpler design, and we're going to do some similar sorts of uh, trials. This machine is currently being demonstrated in uh, Salinas right now. It's going to come back to Yuma um, uh, in a couple weeks here. Uh, where where I, I think an uh, excellent fit for uh, steam application is in high density crops. We can uh, do it primarily for weed control, treat just the top inch, inch and a half, and it's also a, a crop where our hand weeding costs are, are very high. So that concludes my talk, and if we have any time for questions, happy to answer them. So um, while I'm giving this talk, um, the reality is that I didn't do any of this work because we haven't had much of a carob moth issue here in Yuma until very recently. And so much of this is from Dr. Tom Perring at the University of California at Riverside and his assistants, um, Justin Ney, and also some from Sonia Rios, who until recently was the farm advisor for Riverside County. So uh, this is the carob moth. Um, you probably, in your average everyday life, won't necessarily see it in this form uh, very much. Um, but uh, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the effect of the carob moth on date palm fruit. That's going to be pretty easy. We're going to talk about a bit about the biology of the carob moth. We'll talk about the control of the carob moth in the orchard. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, how we might control the carob moth in the packing house. And uh, we'll We'll hit mostly on, uh, well, not only organic methods, but conventional methods as well. Well, so this is what you don't really want to see. This is not the way you want to see a carob moth. You open up your nice juicy medjool date, and you see this larvae in there. You know, and the old saying is, what's worse than a 
than a larvae in an apple, half a larvae, you know. So uh, anyway, we don't want to we want don't want to do that. So uh, you know, you open it up, you see the larvae, you see the frass, um, and at least in uh, the Coachella Valley, particularly among the the uh, deglet newers over there, there have been years when up between 10 and 40 percent of the crop is uh, lost of the harvestable crop is lost because of um, of the uh, moth. And then in Morocco, I've uh, read up to 30% some years. So this can be a real issue. And like I say, it hasn't been much of an issue here until recently. Um, the growers contacted me a few weeks ago about uh, some issues they have been having. And we had a meeting. And so I think maybe there's some education that needs to be done. So this is the carob moth life stage. Uh, the A is the egg. The egg starts out kind of creamy, and then as it, as it matures, it turns rather pink. Um, and the first instar larvae, larvae there at A. The second uh, B is the late instar live, larvae, and that's the one that does a lot of the eating uh, in the date fruit with lots of frass, so it's eating well and it's producing frass. And then uh, there is the silk cap at the calyx end of the fruit, so what happens is, is after it... Um, after it goes through the various uh, larval stages, it makes a silk cap at the calyx end of the date fruit. And then finally, you can find the pupa in the, in the silken chamber there, um, which is inside the date. So uh, none of this, of course, is what we'd really like to see. And uh, another kind of a, maybe a better picture from, uh, from uh, Tom and Sonia is you've got the egg there on the left. You've got the new larvae pink, actively feeding. You've got the mature <coughs> larvae, uh, also pink and actively feeding. Then the pre-pupa, when it stops feeding, it sp spins the silk cocoon. Then the pupa, um, where it is uh, turning, of course, into the adult, and then the adult. So the carob moth damage is to the fruit is caused by the developing larvae, and the first and the second instars um, are the uh, small ones. Um, that, are, that can be fumigated in the field, but they're sometimes difficult to detect in the finished date product. Um, but at the second post larvae uh, consumes large portions of the date fruit. And of course you have lots of frass, none of which you or your consumer wants to see. So the adult moth lays eggs and she tries to hide the eggs. And so she does that, on, lays the eggs on the fruit in the wrinkles of the date fruit, if it's mature in what we call the tamar stage or the brown stage, under the calyx sometimes to hide it, um, not on the leaves, okay? It, they only lay their eggs on the fruit. And they enter the date fruit at the calyx end, which is kind of the opening there, just underneath the cap. And uh, if you were to pull off a date, sometimes you'll actually pull that cap off. And uh, it inf the, immediately after the egg hatches, the first instar larvae move directly into the fruit. They don't wait around. And then as they grow, they begin to spin this web at the calyx end of the date. And this particular um, insect is omnivorous. It's got lots of, um, lots of hosts. Carobs, naturally, carob moth, pomegranates, pistachios, almonds, citrus, uh, 43 hosts from 18 plant families. So it is um, everywhere. Uh, if, if, you got it, if you got it, it can be found everywhere. So it's important to remember that the larvae feed only on the fruit. Uh, they will overwinter November to February on the fruit on the ground, sometimes in the leaf axles, um, in bunches. If you don't cut all the bunches that are hanging from the tree, the larvae will overwinter in there. And also sometimes if you go out to the orchard, you'll find occasionally there's a date that's been impaled on a spine and that will sit there over the winter time, and that particular date might very well have the overwintering larvae in it. So the overwintering uh, moths will oviposit on waste dates on the ground and on the abscised green or what we call the Kimri dates that fall to the ground or get to the stuck, stuck in the bunch, and that would happen in the spring. So the message is that these are, at this point, those, these are the dates that are on the ground that are the problem. And then the moths that develop from that um, that uh, life cycle oviposit on the yellow dates, the fallen dates. And we get the yellow dates, or what we call the kalal dates. We get those in June or July, okay? And they'll oviposit on the 
on the fallen yellow dates, but they don't uh, attack the healthy ones that are on the strand. Okay, they have to be softer and they have to be a little bit sweeter um, in order for them to be uh, in order for them to be a target for oviposition. And then the next life cycle, the moths on those yellow dates will oviposit on the brown ones. Okay, and these brown ones can be on the ground or they can be in the bunch. Um, so they um, they could be anywhere. And then the moths from those brown dates, the root, root top dates, those are the ones that are hanging and still brown, will also oviposit on the fallen, really dark brown ones that kind of get into what we call the tamar stage. So when they're really quite wrinkled and dry and yet still edible, um, that's called the tamar stage, and they will oviposit into those. And those um, are the larvae that overwinter to do the cycle again. So generally speaking, most of the oviposition occurs on dates that are on the ground, except for when the dates are quite ripe and hanging on the bunch. So uh, Tom did some work uh, quite a while ago, and this is the relationship between the number of infested fruits and the number of webbed fruits. So if you see a web in a fruit, it's infested. The relationship is 99, 96%, okay? It's really uh, quite, uh, quite obvious. Oh. Naturally, then, what do we do in the orchard? Well, field sanitation. Uh, and the growers nece haven't necessarily always been all that good with field sanitation. They're better than they used to be. Um, one way, it's easy, it's simple, is to cultivate the orchard floor regularly. Certainly after harvest is finished, there's dates on the ground. You want to cultivate those into the ground, break them up, destroy them. You will reduce the overwintering population. There may be other times of the year when you want to cultivate in order to reduce the, the numbers of fruit that might be host for the larvae that are on the ground. Cut the centers. Now, of course, in medjools, that's a normal practice. In deglets, it's not, okay? So a lot of this infestation work has been done on, on deglets, and cutting the centers out of a deglet uh, bunch isn't as normal as what we would do in medjools. But if for some reason a center doesn't get cut, cut out of a bunch, that can mean that the dates are all packed in there. And what happens then is you'll have a date that falls off of the bunch, but it won't fall out of the bunch, okay? So you'll have, if you have a lot of dates that are all packed in there because you haven't cut out the centers, then what happens is you have abscised dates that are sitting in the middle of the bunch, and they are rotting, and they are providing fantastic habitats for the larvae. Tie the bags closed in July before the fruit reach the root tab stage, okay? So we'll talk about bags in a minute, but one way to keep the dates, um, the, the fallen dates, the dates from falling on the floor, of course, is to make sure they stay inside the bags. And I think one of the reasons why we've had a bit of a, more of a problem with this recently is because the growers haven't been as good in tying the bags or getting the bags up in time. You know, maybe they've been busy or whatever the case might be. And so tie the bags closed so, the, so they don't drop fruit on the ground, okay? And we'll come back to the bags in a minute. And then collect the waste dates when harvesting. You know, typically what might happen is the, date, the, the workers would simply throw the dates that are not worth harvesting in, onto the field and leave. Well, that means you have a population in the field. Now, of course, it's not necessarily all that great to take them to the packing house, but at some point they need to be destroyed. And so they either need to, if you're going to throw them on the ground, they need to be disked in and destroyed, and if you take them to the waste dates of the packing house, they need to be destroyed. So that's field sanitation, and I think that's the, the number one, the, the, that is a very important key to this problem. Now, of course, bags. Well, deglet dates are not always grown using these mesh bags like we do. They oftentimes use paper covers, and so there was some work which showed that if you put mesh bags over deglets, and the same would work for medjools, and you have a mesh of 1.7 millimeters and smaller, you will keep the larva, you will keep the adults out of the dates, okay? Up to 89% of the infestation can be, be um, reduced uh, by using the, the bags and, and tying them up properly on time. I think that's another issue. Again, you put the bags on, but you don't get around to tying them up on time. The third thing is something that was developed in Coachella, again, in the, in the, in the um, 
in the uh, Deglet orchards where they're using pheromones. This is called SPLAT. Okay, it is a mating disruption control for a carob moth. It is by some uh, folks known as Iscatech. And what it does and what all pheromones do, at least, at least in this case, mating disruption, is it overstimulates the males with a sex pheromone to disrupt the mating cycle, deters the males from mating with the females. Okay, so really what happens is, you know, you've got a bunch of females out there emitting pheromone, but you have a bunch of splats out there emitting pheromone, and there are just so many females or splats in the middle of the orchard that the males can't figure out where to go, and they do not mate with the females as often because oftentimes they're fooled by going to the splats. And the splat, in this case, you can kind of see is um, this gray thing right there. They, they will, it, it, you can put it on as a, through a caulking gun or something like that. You can also put it on um, over the row or with, with sprayers. So the recommendation of the company is to modify your, um, or uh, to, uh, to monitor your populations of the carob moth and use when the populations are dense to help deter mating activity. Chemical control. Now, chemical control is something that is obviously can be used, but many growers here aren't going to use it because they want to remain organic. But if you choose to go down the road of conventional growing dates, you may want to do chemical control, and there is a couple of pretty good products um, that could be used. And so this was a study done in 2008 on 20-year-old trees that Tom Perring did and his people, um, and they planted, they did two bunches per tree and they made applications in August, September, and October, and they put on 100 gallons per acre, 30 PSI, completely randomized design. And these are what the deglets look like before um, they applied the products. And uh, here they are applying the products. And you can see a typical scientific study with small plots. And here's the, here are the dates after the product's been applied. And so what are the products? Well, the products are, uh, in this case, uh, they use malathion. Well, malathion works well, but I don't believe anybody wants to use it anymore. But, and uh, belt, I'm not familiar with belt, but intrepid and delegate are both registered for control of this insect on date palm. And those are the ones that are being used in the Coachella Valley in conventional dates. So intrepid, delegate, both of them are Corteva products. Um, and you can see they uh, reduce the uh, numbers of, in, of infestations by at least 50 percent, actually um, three quarters in the case of delegate and probably uh, 95 percent in the case of intrepid. So the recommendation from Dr. Pairing is if you're going to use the uh, use the uh, both the splat and the uh, one or both better to use both of the insecticides is to start out with the splat Okay, apply once per year in early September. It will lower the infestation rate to about 8%. Oops, go back. Um, and then go through and use Delegate, and then use um, Intrepid and alternate use of those so you don't get um, uh, resistance. And so that's the general, the general way they go about solving this problem in um, conventional orchards in Coachella. But if you're not going to use conventional, you're going to have to deal with organic, and there is no, really no way to control this organically other than these field, in the field other than these field sanitation uh, methodologies and the judicious use of the bags. Okay, but that's in the field. Now, in the packing house, there are a couple of additional steps that can be taken care of, that can be done. Firstly, just destroy the waste dates. Certainly, you don't want to bring all the waste dates into the packing house and then have them infest what you're, what you're um, packing. And so you need to at least at some point get them out of the packing house and destroy them. You need to employ a kill step. This is a fairly common um, thing going on. You need to uh, be able to heat the dates. You know, we, we uh, will dry the dates. So this is not, this employing a kill step is not a problem on dates that aren't ripe enough because you need to heat them in order to ripen them, but for the dates that are already ripe, sufficiently ripe, they might not get as good of a kill step as they might otherwise. And I think what needs to happen is it, it's, a, it's a little bit dicey in that you don't want to get the temperature up to about 60 degrees Celsius because that will turn your dates, that'll discolor the dates. And so the temperatures that you get them are somewhere between 50 and 55 degrees and that's something that probably has to be worked out at the individual packing house. 
Um, but what happens is when you apply this kill step at anywhere between 50 and 55 degrees, the adults will emerge from the, uh, from the dates and the larvae will emerge from the dates and they'll die from the heat. At least most of them will. The second thing to do is to freeze them thoroughly, okay? And that means anywhere between 14 degrees Fahrenheit at the high end and minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit at the low end, minus 10 to minus 25 degrees Celsius. And so I discovered this very interesting piece of work from the University of Minnesota. Not that they grow dates there, but they ha are dealing with Indian meal moth larvae in storage facilities. And of course, Minnesota, it's cold. And so they were t thinking about how much cold temperature is necessary to kill Indian meal moth. And Indian meal moth is quite closely related to the carob moth. And they looked at the various um, instars and the eggs and the pupa and the adults. And they looked at SCP. And SCP basically is the temperature at which the insect dies, okay? Um, and so at the egg and at the first larvae, and the numbers there, 44, 19, 26, 23, are the numbers of, of individual uh, insects or eggs that actually died. So um, 44 of the eggs died at about minus 25. At the first instar, maybe minus 22. And then when you get to the second instar, it only takes about minus 12 to kill them. And when you get down to the pupae and the adult, it takes down again between minus 20 and minus 25. So if you're trying to kill eggs or early or first instar larvae or adults, you're going to have to get down between 20 and 25 degrees below um, uh, my, uh, my Celsius. Okay. So, um, and then there's another study where they actually did some work with lab-reared insects versus uh, field collected insects and they went and they did this outdoors so they looked at the mortality rate of the insects depending upon the month and of course Minnesota in September is still relatively warm but by the time they got to October, November, December and January um, they were able to um, kill the insects at a super cooling point of somewhere between minus 20 and minus 25 degrees C. So I think that's what's happening in the case of our packing houses and the, one of the reasons why we're having this as an issue is several fold. If we go backwards, I think one of the problems is we're freezing the dates, but we're not freezing them cold enough. Okay? Maybe because you know you measure what it is in the freezer and it's maybe minus 20 degrees C, but in the middle of that pallet it's not. So what I've got here is I've got a temperature sensor. I think it's important to get some temperature sensors and drop them in the middle of those pallets full of date boxes and see whether or not you're actually getting to the temperatures that you want to get. The other thing is maybe the kill steps aren't being applied properly. Again, maybe the temperatures on the outside of the pallets are hotter than the temperatures on the inside of the pallet. The other issue I think that's happening is maybe because we have had so many dates or maybe because we have issues with labor, we're not getting the date bags on on time and the insects are getting into the dates because we're not excluding them from the bags. So those are just my opinions on what's actually happening in regards to uh, why we're having this much of an issue. I do believe that it's possible to reduce the infestation rates of these things quite significantly without having to use conventional insecticides, um, but if you need to, there's a couple of real good tools to take care of it. Everybody, let's put our hands together for Dr. Wright. All right. Thank you very much.